good faith looks like and how good religion and how we should follow Jesus. Don't you get tired of learning about the right way? Oh, okay. Because today, we're going to learn about how to do it the bad way. We're, the title of this sermon is Bad Religion. Bad Religion. And, and for those of you that are slower on the uptake, and it's okay to be different, it's not wrong, bad religion is the way we don't want to do it, okay? So don't, don't study about bad religion and say, oh, that could be fun. No, we're, we're taking this as an example of how we don't want to, to practice our faith. So the title of today's sermon is Bad Religion. Sometimes you're going to hear people say, Sometimes you can hear people say that when it comes to faith, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Have you, have you ever heard people say that? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Now, like we saw on the news recently, you might be very sincere about, you know, doing something nasty to somebody. Uh, but there's this belief out there that, that all faith is the same and it doesn't really matter what you believe you just have to have sincerity with it. Or people sometimes say that all religions are true. They're all equally valid. Now, I have to admit that this is a very powerful uh, argument. It's not a logical argument, okay? It, 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 there's, no, there's no reasonable content there. There's nothing rational there. But it's a powerful emotional argument. Like, who are you to, to think that your religion is better? Do you notice that that's not, there's nothing logical there? It's just that we, we react to it instinctively. There's an emotional content there. Uh, it's, it's so it's, it's strong that it's like saying, well, why? I, I want to be humble, right? Humility is a virtue. So, yeah, I believe Jesus, and you believe what you believe, you know. And we all believe, you know, the Aztecs, who are we to judge that, that they like to cut the hearts out of people while they're still pumping so the sun will rise the next day? All religions are equally valid. Uh, so there's an, uh, an emotional strength there, but there's really no logical content. Uh, logically, if you think about it, it's impossible for all religions to be true. Right? Because one religion says that Jesus is God. And then another religion will say, Islam will say that Jesus is a prophet. And then in, in Hinduism, they've got millions of gods. And Jesus is actually one of those millions of God and gods. And some Buddhists believe that that Jesus was an enlightened teacher. And so, and, and then in, uh, in, in one uh, religious group in the United States, you have a, uh, a group of people who would say that Jesus is, is an angel. Or you see, have people who believe that uh, God and, and Satan are just two sides of the same coin or, they're, or, or the exact opposites, but they're both equal. You have all these different ideas. Listen, contradicting ideas cannot both be true. Bob is not both sitting down and standing up. It's one or the other. Oh, how can you be so close-minded? Well, no, I think he's sitting down. I believe it, it he's, doesn't matter what he is. He's doing both or whatever. You know, could be, could be, logically, all religions can be false. That's actually an acceptable, logical conclusion. All religions could be false. But because they contradict one another, they can't all be true. Put the emotion aside. They can't all be true. Let me say that again. That emotional argument, who are you to say one religion is better than another? Put that aside. It's not rational. All religion could be false, but they just can't all be true. Contradicting ideas, and they all contradict about Jesus Christ, cannot all be true, and it doesn't matter how you feel about that. Feelings don't count. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. If I say that Aaron Williams is at church today, he either is or he ain't, and it doesn't matter how emotionally I feel about that. And we could have, we could have a group of people that say, well, uh, Aaron is, is uh, right now he's in Europe. We have another group of people that are really, really adamant and say, no, Aaron is at home playing Xbox, heretic. <laughs> and other people say, yeah, you know, I don't know all things. From my perspective, I really believe that Aaron's here. I'm not claiming all knowledge. I'm claiming I think Aaron's here this morning. How could you be so close-minded to say that Aaron is here? Don't you know that all views on Aaron are equally valid? That, isn't that silly? That is silly. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. And if that bothers you emotionally, the problem is not with truth. 
problem may be is that uh, we're acting too emotionally. Today, we're going to see how Christ himself interacted with the religious people of his day. Here's a clue. The God of the Bible does not think that all religion is equally valid. Newsflash. All right, let's turn to Mark chapter 3. As we read through Mark 3, I want you to ask yourself, do you think Jesus believed that all religious expressions were equally valid? Mark chapter 3, and we're going to start with the first six verses. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So there you go to synagogue, you go to church, and you're there looking for a reason to criticize, looking for a reason to be bent out of shape. These people are at church, at synagogue, and they're looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Right away, you know you're doing your religion wrong. Can I get an amen? If you're going there looking for a reason to be critical, to complain, you're doing it wrong. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely. Don't you just love it when people are watching you closely to see how you can trip up? That is such a blessing. Uh, they were watching him closely, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. We're going to do this. Then Jesus asked, uh, asked them, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to be good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? That should have been an easy question, right? Jesus said, okay, because he knew what they're thinking. What's better, good or evil, saving life or killing? And the Bible says they remain silent. You know, you're in a nasty place when you can't answer that question. He looked around at them in anger. Not all anger is wrong. He was angry at their religion. Their religion allowed them to be self-righteous. Their religion allowed them to be judgmental. Their religion blinded them so they could not see the one who loved them and was wanting to die for them. The one who was going to suffer for them, standing before them, and all they could think was negative things about him. You look at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Doesn't that make you think, well, I don't want God to be angry. I don't want him to see my faith and be deeply distressed. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees praised God and said, this is wonderful. Look at good has happened today. Uh, you have a different translation? Yeah? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot my glasses. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What? That's bad religion, isn't it? Now, if you also know something here, the Pharisees and the Herodians did not like each other. Everybody reading this knew those two groups did not like each other. Uh, they were mortal enemies, and yet... They're so angry that Jesus would do good on the Sabbath that they are now, they're tomodachi, they're amigo. They're, uh, they're friends together, and they're trying to figure out <coughs> how to put an end to all the good things that Jesus is doing. So that's a clue. In your heart, if uh, you find yourself quickly killing people, in the sense that, oh, I'm so sick of this. I'm, I'm tired of them. I'm going to cut them off. No more. I'm not going to put up with this. If that's the mantra running through your head, bad religion. Bad religion. Uh, next, Mark tells his readers, number one, uh, Christ has authority to heal. Two, he has authority over evil spirits. We saw this before. Mark's coming back on this again. It's not like Satan and God are equal. God says it. And the powers of evil, they have to obey. And number three, people are crowding around Jesus at this point. People are crowding around Jesus. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there was genuine faith there, but he's drawing a crowd. He's drawing a big crowd. So let's look at Mark chapter 3 now uh, from verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. 
When they heard, when they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, from Jerusalem, uh, Idumea, and from the region across the Jordan, and from Tyre and Sidon, the old Phoenician cities. Uh, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. Uh, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. So our God is a God who can heal our God. Nothing is impossible for him. He can accomplish everything. These miracles were signs pointing to who he was. Uh, number 11, uh, verse 11, whenever the evil spirits uh, saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him at this point. Uh, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to uh, him those he wanted, and they came to him. So he's gathering his disciples right now. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name uh, Bonarges, which means sons of thunder. And it's so interesting to see God incarnate saying, these boys are sons of thunder. I don't think it was necessarily approving of it so much as kind of cynically say, yeah, these guys are full of thunder and lightning. Uh, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the men Christ chose because I know we have a lot of churches named after these men, and they're important, very important, and we praise God for their example. The Bible doesn't actually talk about them in, as individuals that much. Uh, the focus in the scripture is always on Jesus Christ. The focus is always on God. But I do want to point out, these guys, they're not the most desirable. This is a pretty mixed bag of people. They're not the smartest. If they were the, among the smartest, they would have already been chosen by a rabbi to be their disciples. The best students were already chosen. The students who couldn't uh, become a student of a rabbi, they became, they took other jobs. And so these students were not the smartest in their class. They're not the most popular. Matthew was a traitor. Who in their right mind calls a traitor to be part of their cause to try to win people's love and affection and, and, and get momentum and popularity? You, you don't. How would the world feel if, if Billy Graham or some famous politician or, or, or some famous businessman started chumming around with a known traitor to the United States? Matthew was getting rich by working with an occupying army, the Roman Empire. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to take you too. These people were not the smartest, not the richest, not the most popular. Several of them clearly have issues. And Jesus is going to use them to rock the entire world. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to ever look around this room and say, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough of this. We don't have enough of that. We aren't talented enough. We're not smart enough. We don't have enough charisma. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough power. Jesus can take any group of people and use them for his glory. So the question is, do you want to be used for the glory of Jesus? Do you want God to do something beautiful and wonderful through our group? Do you want God to, to speak through you and love through you and bless through you? When Jesus called the disciples, they answered. They went up the mountain. When God calls, we go running. And God can use anybody who's willing, anybody who's faithful, anybody who's available. Brothers and sisters, availability always trumps talent. Availability trumps smarts. I'm pointing this out because I don't want us to ever forget in our church Genuine faithfulness, being a man of faith, a woman of faith. Faithfulness means trustworthy, dependable, reliable. Willingness to go beyond our preconceived comfort zones, that's faith. I'm going to go outside of my self-definition. I'm going to step out in faith. God, what do you need me to be to bless people in this situation? Not telling God how he has to do it. And just being available for God's use, saying, God, I'm not the smartest. I don't, I don't have the most to offer, Lord God. There's a lot of people who are better speakers than me. There's a lot of people who are better singers than me. Lord, here I am, and boy, is there a place in heaven? Can you, can you use me for your kingdom, Lord, please? And I promise you, God 
loves people like that. And God will use people like that. Availability. Faithfulness. Willingness. All of this mean more to God than having a big, beautiful building, having the best sermons and ministries, the best worship team. I also want to point this out because I'm hoping, again, that we can start another service. We don't have money. We don't have a lot of things that we need, right? But we can pray. Isn't that a beautiful thing to say? Yeah, we don't have enough people, but we can pray. We don't have enough money, but we can pray. We don't, we don't have all the talents that, that maybe some bigger churches have, but we can pray. And we can show up. It's huge when you show up because you bless everybody else. It's huge just showing up. Be an encouragement to everyone around you. Be available and say, I want to see what God's going to do when his people get excited. I, I want to see what God can do when his people show up. I want to see what God can do when his people are eager to serve. And to have that excitement, that hunger within us, God willing, if, if somebody gives us a free building or a place we can meet, there's no reason why we shouldn't get this going. Amen? Amen. Amen. We can do this. And, and I, I really believe we do that, there will be more people in heaven. And brothers and sisters, that, like, that's the measure. That is the measure to say if what we're doing is worthwhile or not. Are people going to hear the gospel? Or are they going to meet Jesus Christ? Uh, let's turn to Mark chapter 3 from verse 20 now. And we're going to go right to the end of the chapter. And we're going to discuss another vision that's on my heart, something I'd like to see our church do. I don't know if this is going to work. I hope so. It's, it's exciting me. Uh, let's read from verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, uh, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Well, that's unreasonable. That's taking Christianity too far, isn't it? Have to skip a meal? For, for the gospel, uh, I don't know about that. Everything in moderation. Don't want to love people too much. Uh, isn't it horrible when you don't sound like Jesus? Uh, verse 21. When his family heard about this, when Jesus' family heard that he actually was skipping meals, they went out to take charge of him because they said, he's out of his mind. Brothers and sisters, if you put Jesus first, somebody among your friends or families or coworkers might say, man, you're crazy. Why are you giving so much priority? Why are you giving so much time? Why are you giving so much of your money to that stuff? To people, when they're not putting things of God first, they will think you are, you know, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. They're going to think that something broke down. If you put Jesus first, there will be people who are going to come and try to take charge of you and say, listen, it's okay to believe in God, but you are becoming fanatical about this you're putting way too much of your life you're pouring your life into the things of God and so Jesus himself his own family came and they said no he's he's acting crazy he's out of his mind we need to get him out of there and the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said he's possessed so isn't it horrible listen to this not only to the people who are your enemies say this man's possessed this man's crazy you've got your own family members who should have your back they're saying, we got to get him out of here. He's crazy. Isn't that horrible? When, it's, when you're getting it from one side and the other side, and this is what we see, Jesus, right here. He's catching it from both sides, from his own family. His own family. He's possessed, the teacher of the law said, uh, by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him, say, you guys, hey, get over here. And he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Remember we saw in Matthew, who's the strong man? Jesus. He's talking about himself. And I think in context, the plunder is people that are held in the thrall of Satan. What we saw back in, in Matthew, Satan trying to control people's lives, trying to keep them on this highway to hell, and Jesus is a strong man that can come in, 
kick Satan's butt time up and say, I'm going to take this person. This person's mine. This person has lived all their lives uh, running away from me. They're going to see me now, and people turn to Jesus, and their lives are changed. And Jesus can do this. And he's saying, this doesn't make any sense. You're saying, I'm doing this by the power of Satan, but I'm plundering his house. I'm plundering his house because Jesus says he is a strong man. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven all their sins and all the blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of eternal sin. I'm going to get back to that in a moment. Then he said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. He said this because they said he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus said, Who are my mothers and who are my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and says, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Well, don't you want to be, do God's will then? Don't you want to do God's will? And so Jesus will say, this is my family. Jesus will look at us and say, this is my family. To have Jesus proud of us. Uh, we've been discussing uh, in the uh, leadership discipleship group. I disciple a group on, Dad and I disciple a group on uh, Wednesday nights. That's also our leadership team and people that are kind of apprenticing for the leadership team. And uh, we've been talking about, because we, we go through and we study these great theological materials. We've been doing it for years. And we've been studying what is the unforgivable sin. Well, I want to first point out that if you're really worried that you've committed the unforgivable sin, you haven't. The, the Pharisees here, the teachers of the law, they didn't care. Jesus said, you guys commit the unforgivable They don't care. But a person who says, oh, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to offend God in that way. I don't want to do the thing that would drive me away from God. That's a good clue that you haven't done it. And I want to say something else. On YouTube, a few years ago, there was this kick where a bunch of people, a lot of them teenagers, would post a video and say, my name is Buck Rogers. They'd say whatever their name is. My name is Flash Gordon, and I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. As if they're doing something. And I thought, oh, man, you guys don't even know how to blaspheme right. You guys, you guys, this is so pathetic. You know, God, in his grace, he can forgive you easily. Just turn around and, and see Jesus. He'll forgive that. You think you've committed the unforgivable sin? You're like an amateur at sinning. You don't even know. <coughs> but what we see here is people who see God at work and say, that's of the devil. We see, people, we see uh, God at work and say, I don't believe that. I don't have any time for that. In the unforgivable sin... In our context, because we don't have Jesus standing with us performing miracles that people can say that about. In our context, the unforgivable sin was all your life to hear about Jesus. You say, I hate Jesus, all this stuff. That all can be forgiven. But in your heart, you've said, and I will not believe. I'm going to deny the Holy Spirit. I'm going to reject the Holy Spirit. And that's what cannot be forgiven. Because if we turn to Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of all sin. But saying, I will not turn, I will not turn, that's a sin that can't be forgiven. Because salvation is found in Jesus Christ. You receive the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. You want to keep the Holy Spirit at arm's length. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. So, are you worried you've committed the unforgivable sin? Here's what you've got to do. Say, God, I don't know if I'm a Christian yet. I want to be. Please forgive me. And you know what? Jesus Christ, he loves us so much. He never has turned away one person who came to him saying, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I want to be part of your family. I want to, I want to do things your way, God. I'm going to leave behind the past. Lord, I'm coming to you. And Jesus Christ turns away nobody. 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 Amen. So the unforgivable sin is to die to be hardened in our heart to the point that we're never going to accept the Holy Spirit. We're never going to accept the work of God. We're never going to accept the cross. We're going to turn our back. There are so many sins. Every sin can be forgiven except for turning our back on the things of God. This brings me up to the other thing that's on my heart. And boy, I hope, I hope we can keep going forward. I, I'm fired up about these things. I, I want to see what God can do. In, in, this is on my heart. We've had this great time with our leadership discipleship team on Wednesday nights. I love it. I've told the men several times, the material we're studying 
this is like a seminary class, but we're, we're finding ways to practically apply it. It's beautiful. The textbooks are about, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks. They're large. Uh, you can get a, a, a CD set for, that comes along with it for, for a little bit extra money. It comes from the Great Commission itself. Uh, next year, God willing and should the Lord tarry, I would like to hold an intense theology class on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to 7.30. And I want to invite anybody in the church who says, yeah. That, that kind of question about, about uh, unforgivable sin, that kind of stuff like predetermination, free will, all those kind of things. And I want to learn more about that. And I'm going to open, this, this class is open up to men and women, anybody who, who wants to, but I'm looking for people who are committed. I want you to buy the textbook so that you can show some commitment. You're going to say, well, that's kind of, you know, a little bit of money. And, and we, we have the class of probably about uh, three times a month. And I will, I want people to say, yeah, I'm going to do my best to be there. I understand you can't be there all the time, but I want somebody to say, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there as often as I can. From 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday, we're looking for people who are hungry to learn more theology. And each week you'll have anywhere from usually around 10 to 20 pages to read. Uh, sometimes there's uh, written materials as well. Uh, and we'll have a lot of time for discussion. And I expect you to do your reading before you come. And I am excited. And I, I hope a lot of you say yes. I hope a lot of you start thinking about this and say, yeah, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. So please think about that. So this is my heart, my vision for the church. We want to keep going forward. Let's find another location. Let's start another service on, on Friday nights. And I want to have a theology class right here on Wednesday evenings. And, man, I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm so excited about this stuff. I hope, that I, that, uh, I hope the Holy Spirit is touching some hearts out there. And I'm hoping some of you say, yeah, I want to be a part of this stuff. So... Last thought, Jesus, Jesus wasn't crazy. He worked hard to share the gospel. He worked hard to show people the truth. Jesus wasn't crazy. The crazy thing is to prioritize anything over God. What did I just say? Not to prioritize anything over God. Jesus was not crazy. The crazy thing is to prioritize anything over God. Uh, Right now, we're in a place where we get to see God do something. Let's pray, and let's, let's just ask God to do something beautiful in our church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we can accomplish nothing in our own strength. Lord, we, we look around and see the good things that have happened, and the, the many people have been saved and baptized. And, and Father, we just say, Lord, thank you for using us in our weakness. Thank you, Lord, that you look down from heaven. You see a small church, and you say, I can use that. Father, we ask that you would... You'd stir us up. Father, please uh, work a miracle. We want to we rejoice. Give us a reason to rejoice, Lord. Please do something beautiful in our midst. We praise your name. Thank you, God, for being there with us these last uh, 11 years. Pray this all in your name, Lord. Amen. <laughs>